Well, you're going to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to read for you Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 through 3. Talking today about the foundation of resurrection of the dead. Hebrews 6 and verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. So there in that passage, Paul says, let's leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ. We're going to perfection, not laying again these principles, repentance from dead works, faith towards God, doctrine of baptisms. And here's mentioned the resurrection of the dead. He says, we're not going to lay this foundation again. In other words, this foundation has already been laid. He's already talked with them at length. He's already established these things. But look what he says in verse 3. And this will we do if God permits. So even though Paul for a moment is leaving it behind, he's also leaving it open that he's going to revisit this again with the Hebrews church. And what that tells me is that these foundational truths are something that needs to be revisited again and again and again. It's not something that we can just... Leave it behind and carry on. And Paul's direction here in his teaching is he's going to go on unto perfection. He's going to go on unto things that are completion type doctrines. Some deeper things here in Hebrews. Nevertheless, he also acknowledges that these things that he's listed here, and as we've studied week by week and best we could, as, as I felt inspired and led to do so, these things are foundational and need to be present and solid before we can go on unto perfection perfection. And so as I've often promised, these are these are truths that are foundational, but they're not necessarily simple Bible truths, okay? So in 1 Corinthians, if anyone was to ask, you know, well where should I go if I want to learn about the resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15 immediately comes to mind. It's the resurrection chapter in many people's minds. So turning to 1 Corinthians 15, Let's begin in verse 12, where we'll find the importance of the resurrection. Verse 12, it says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ, or if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our, is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Here, the Apostle Paul is highlighting the fact that if the resurrection isn't a thing, if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. It's empty. It's nothing. You're letting, yet in your sins, you're perished. Here he makes it the extreme example and says, we are of all men most miserable. Take your heathen, take your unbeliever, take your glutton drunk, take anybody that you would say, man, that guy is miserable. Hey, if Christ isn't raised, we're of all men most miserable. We're putting our faith in something that will not save. Not only that, but we are also testifying of the living God that something happened, that he did something that never happened. We're blaspheming, essentially, if Christ be not risen. And so the importance of the resurrection is that it is the crux of the whole matter. The whole faith rises and falls on whether or not the resurrection even took place. He continues on, but, verse 20, Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Not only is Christ risen, he's the first of many that are sleeping and will rise. Who's he referring to? Those that fell asleep and are perished, and those that will perish and leave this life, those that would be miserable had they not this hope, is who we're talking about here. Christ is risen. The Apostle Paul vehemently affirms, 
Christ is risen. Not only that, he's the first fruits of all them that slept and that have passed away in Christ. That's the importance of this resurrection. It, it's paramount. It is the most important thing to the faith that we are now gathering around. If there's no resurrection, let us eat and drink from all we die. Let's go home, people. There's no hope. There's nothing to this, okay? But the resurrection did happen. Yay, now is Christ risen. He's alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Amen. <clears throat> That's the importance of. Now let's look at the potency of the resurrection. Verse 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your Shame. The potency of this resurrection is that you can awake or resurrect or arise to what? Righteousness and sin not. Awake to that. Be aware of that. Awake to righteousness. It's that same statement that we're studying out in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 where it says, Of the saved, they are saved unto good works. Awake to righteousness. God rose you for a purpose. You were dead and now you are alive. Awake unto righteousness. Or the opposite is true. And in this very verse 34, I speak this to your shame. <clears throat> Either awake to righteousness or be ashamed. Okay? Is what the Bible is referring to here. Now go to Ephesians chapter. You can leave a bookmark there in Corinthians. It's not too far. Ephesians chapter 5 where we will talk about that same statement be ashamed. In Ephesians chapter 5, and in verse 12, you're just a few books to the right there. Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 12, the Bible says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But the things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Christ as the light certainly brings things to light manifests truths that are often concealed. Now, we can say, yeah, it is a shame to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, and certainly that is true. There are a lot of dark things that go on in dark places that we ought not even speak of because they would defile a man to learn of such things. <clears throat> but the same is true. The Bible says, awake to righteousness and sin not. I speak this to your shame. And the truth be told, many of our sins, let's face it, are done in secret. And the things that we all do in secret, we would find immense shame for it to be brought to light. Too often, the things that happen behind closed doors, the things that happen when we think we're all alone, <clears throat> they don't come to light, but nevertheless, they are reproved because God here promises, he says, light makes these things manifest. And Christ is the light. And so as you read scriptures, you're going to find things that go on in the recesses of your mind. You're going to find things that go on in the doors of your house, behind closed doors in your house. Those things are going to be manifest in your spirit and revealed to you as being wrong. Unless you be ashamed, you ought to repent of such things and get them right. Awake unto righteousness. For many don't have that knowledge. Many don't know what God wants for them in their lives. When God shows you something and you're like, yeah, I often do that, you got to just awake to that thing. Be aware of that. God made a light shine on that thing for a reason because he wants you to remove that from your life. Christ, the light, brings the secret things of your heart and the secret things of your bedroom, your closet, whatever, to manifest. He shines the light to reprove you so that you can get it right. Verse 14 continues on and says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And we ought to want that. As Christians, we ought to want Christ to shed light on our darknesses. We ought to want Christ to encourage us to wake up Arise from the dead and get light that he has given. we got to wake up. Go to the word. Sheds light on us. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And that word will reveal unto you, will reveal unto me 
things that are not right so I can get them right. Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, Christ shall give thee light. You ought to want that. Verse 15, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. They call these things spectacles, right? These glasses, spectacles. Circum, that's the first part of a circle. So what do you do? You walk circumspectly, using your eyes, using your spectacles, looking around all the time. In other words, as you walk, you ought to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, don't go to that place. Don't go near that place. I used to haunt that place. I know there's people in that place. There's different things that as you're walking, you can walk wisely by avoiding certain things. Why? Because you're circumspect, looking around, watching for areas that you could stumble in, right? You can walk a path through the woods quite often, just fine and dandy if you're watching where your feet are. You're not going to trip over any roots, fall into a pothole, you know, get tripped up on whatever because you can see it coming. But remove the light and go for that same walk and you'll be on your face hundreds of times. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, and walk in the light that Christ has given us and promised us. Verse 16 continues, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeem. Don't waste time. Take it back. Don't be just flippant with it and let it fall and let it go and, and use it for whatever, take it back. Redeem that time. Redeem it. Bring it to you and use that time. Don't waste it. When, never was it more true than in these last days that time is short. Time is fleeting. Redeem it. Why? Because the days are evil. And we are in evil days today, Christian. Verse 7, it says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, 18 in the first port says, but be not drunk with wine, where is in excess. Okay, so what this is saying is that the unwise are drunk with wine, and there's excess there, and they're, they're not thinking clearly, and their mind is mush, and they're unwise, and they're unskillful, and they're unlearned, and they're drunken fools as a result. But if you go back to the second part of verse 17, the contrast is, but... So don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The most unwise thing you can be, the thing that stamps you as unwise, is if you don't know God's will. Right. You need to know God's will. Because if you don't have it, you don't want it, you don't need it, you're a fool. The Bible clearly indicates that. The second part then of verse 18, but... Be filled with the Spirit. Understanding what the will of the Lord is and being filled with the Spirit are synonymous. Now, how do we get filled with the Spirit? How do we get to the point where we are not unwise, where we are not drunk with wine, where is in excess? How do we get filled with God's Spirit? Look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, to the Lord. And I would encourage any one of you, if you don't have one of those hymn books at home, take it with you. You don't know all the hymns, but certainly you know some of them. Start to read through them. Start to hear them. There's great doctrinal truths in there. And as you sing them, you'll find that they'll commit to your memory even more. You really want to jumpstart your memory of scripture verses? Go online and type in song verses or scripture king james scripture songs or something like that and what you're going to get is all the same scriptures from the bible in song form do you know what happens when you put something to song it gets in your mind really quickly doesn't it all of you can remember a rock song that you heard when you were five years old right that didn't have any problems sticking in your mind right but it's hard for us to memorize scriptures well use that trick god used song to put it into our hearts for a purpose. His biggest book is the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms. He wanted Israel, he wanted God's people to memorize large portions of scriptures. And the best way to do it, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's how you get filled with God's Holy Spirit. Having truths constantly inundated through your heart. Melody flowing through your veins. Hearing the psalms. Hearing the spiritual songs. Singing doctrinal truths all day, every day. Pray to God about this. I had a problem where I was constantly having the, the rock songs that I had loved before in my mind. And I prayed, God, would you have me to wake up every morning and instead of hearing that chunking guitar and those loud drums ringing in my head, could I hear some psalm? Could I hear some spiritual song? Could I hear any hymn at all? And then next morning, I remember waking it up and hearing, Jesus loves me, this I know. 
for the Bible tells me so. And that song went with me the whole day. And then more and more I added to the repertoire and I asked God to memorize more verses and more psalms. And, and that became the melody of my heart, the memory of my life, the memory melody of my walk. And you need that to be full of the Spirit. Awake, thou that sleepest, be full with the Spirit. Don't be unwise, don't be drunk with wine, but know the will of God by getting full of the Spirit. Verse 20 continues, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The next thing that will get you awake, have you be a resurrected, alive believer, is to be thankful. All things, okay? You know what all things is? That's all things, okay? We're not Calvinists. We don't reject that word all. All, that means everything. That means your ups, that means your downs. That means your pains, that means your rejoicings. That means your sufferings, that means your successes. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And there's another one that just comes to my head because I've learned it by song. I jingle quick little song in my head and now I have Colossians in my mind and in my heart ready in a moment to remind myself oh, this situation is really hard I got to rejoice in it I got to be thankful I got to be happy I got to be following Christ and give thanks to him always for all things in the name of the Lord and that's how you can be an awake resurrected believer even today when things are tough verse 21 finally it says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. A lot of people have difficulty submitting themselves to authorities. They buck up. Somebody at their work asks them to do something. You're not my boss. You can't tell me what to do. The Bible encourages us not just to submit to authorities in our lives, but to submit one to another. Do you know what that is? That's a humble spirit. That means if somebody wrongs me, I'm not going to attack and get on them and Fight back on every little thing. I'm going to submit myself. Oh, maybe maybe the brother said something to me because he's having an off day. I'm just going to I'm going to submit. I'm going to yield. I'm going to let that slide. Maybe I'll deal with it on a later date. Submitting to everyone, submitting one to another is not just you being a, a, a somebody that's just always stepped on, walked over and and just pushed down. It's not being a doormat. No, submitting one to another. And look what the Bible says in the fear of the Lord, okay? That's just putting God in his proper place and putting yourself in the proper place under God. Be humble. Be submissive. The, the, the acronym goes this way. The, the joy that Christians ought to have is when you put Jesus, others, before yourself, okay? That ought to be the order. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And that's joy in the Christian life. That's putting others first, putting Jesus above all things. So we've seen the importance of the resurrection. We've seen the potency of the resurrection. The potency is that it can give you, it can give you a life that, that actually gets something done. There, there's, there's potency there in the Christian life that makes you to be full of the Spirit, to be thankful, to be humble and submissive, and, and, to, and to be alive. Alive, alive forevermore, even as Christ is alive. Next, we'll look at the power. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. The power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Albeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also 
that are heavenly. The power in the resurrection is the power of change and transformation. Look what we have here. Dishonor, now raised in glory. A natural body, now raised a spiritual body. Corruption, now incorruptible. He's saying that he can take the earthy, so it dies, right? And when it rises, is now heavenly, is now as Christ. There's transformation there. There is power to change from one form to the other. That's the resurrecting power. Verse 49, it says, As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, talking to believers, that's a for sure promise because as we have borne the image of the earthy, which we all have as we were born in Adam, we certainly bear that for a time in our lives, some of us longer than others, but the promise is still the same as we have done that and that was a sure thing. Now that you are born again, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. That is a promise of a time to come, of course. That is a promise of a transformation that will take place at that last trump, at that last day when Christ trumpet sounds and we shall be changed the bible says in verse 2 and 52 in a moment in a twinkling of eye at that last trumpet for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised in incorruptible that's transformation that's the resurrecting power of god in our lives but while that transformation is not manifest today it's certainly promised to be so and as a promise of God, I believe that we should see glimpses of that change today. We should see glimpses of that transformation in us today. We ought to bear as believers the image of Christ. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 talking about a redeemed, blood-bought, born-again Christian in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, how many? All things are become new. He continues on. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So I believe that we ought to be transformed. There ought to be something showing through of the redeemed man. We ought to be yielding ourselves in that way. The promise is made that we shall be changed in a moment in a twinkling eye at the last trump, but the command is still the same that we ought to bear that image of Christ. See, he says here, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, if you go to Revelation 21 and verse 5, at the end of all things, God just makes it clear and says, hey, behold, I make all things new. And Christ did do that, and he's promising that. What we see isn't necessarily what he's talking about, though, because we know that the new man is redeemed and in us, and it's differently from the old man, which is on the outside, which we walk in every day, right? But... God still requires and requests and commands that we stop walking in that old man and instead let that redeemed, perfect, all things new spirit in us walk in the new man, which is transformed and walks in newness of life, is what the expectation is. So, verse 21, it says this, For he hath made him to be sin for us. So that's a past tense thing from the standpoint of Corinthians. God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So that happened. He made him. That took place. He made Christ sin. Now watch this. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so the apostle Paul is indicating here that we might be made that same righteousness that Christ had. He was made sin. We might be made a righteousness of God. How? Where? In him. You see the difference there? If we're in the flesh, if we're in ourselves, if we're in the world, no wonder why the righteousness of God is not present in our lives. We need to be in Christ to have his righteousness manifested. That's when we bear the image of Christ is when we are in him. Doesn't that make sense? It's like, it's like, it's like Christ is the vessel. We need to get our perfect spirit 
in him. And when we're in him, certainly we bear the image of Christ. And that's what we ought to do as believers. Now, how do we do that? It's a choice we have to make. To be in Christ, we need to make that choice. We must be in Christ. He says, behold, I make all things new. And so when you're in him, you're new because that's his duty. That's his job. Behold, I make all things new. But if you're in this flesh, sorry, you will not be transformed. You will have no power. You will have no potency. You will have no hope in this life. Certainly, if you're born again, you're going to heaven. But as far as exhibiting the image of Christ today, if you're not in him, it's impossible. That just makes sense, right? How can I bear the image of someone that I'm not in, essentially, right? Bearing the image of, it's hard to think about, if if there was a costume you were putting on. I'm bearing the image of, like, you know, a comic book here when I put it on. I'm bearing his image. In the same way, we need to get our spirit in him. It's, it's, it's spiritual discussions that we're talking about here, but, but it, it plays in our mind, I think, in a, a pretty clear way when we think about being in Christ. And when you're in Christ, certainly that's all people should see is Christ himself. So if you're in the flesh, you will not be exhibiting transformational power. There will be no potency in your walk. There will be no hope. Only hope of living a resurrected life is if we live in him. Why? Because Colossians 3 and verse 3 makes that statement, ye are dead. Okay, so when you got saved, you died. Okay, the old man died. Ye are dead, and your life, if you had any of it, is hid with Christ in God. Ye are dead, so the only hope of living a life, a resurrected, transformed life, is to get rid of that dead corpse and take the new man and put it in Christ. Walk in Christ. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So be sure you're not in the flesh. Be sure also in these last days you're not part of the wrong resurrection. And this is something that I, it's God's still working on me with. The Bible records the last day's empire to be mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the world. And so certainly everything that's going on in her domain is going to be a little mysterious, a little veiled, a little confusing to somebody, but I believe Christ is going to start to give us clarity upon certain of these things. Now, go with me to Revelation chapter 17, and we'll discuss that even as Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11 says that there is another Jesus, there is another spirit, and there is another gospel, which are not another but there be those that would pervert the gospel of Christ, right? But nevertheless, there's going to be another Jesus that people are going to seek after. There will be another spirit that people will seek after, another gospel. If you're saved, you're going to recognize, that's not my Christ. That's the voice of a stranger. You're going to know, that's not the true gospel. Works will not save. You're going to say, that's another spirit because... God's not the author of confusion. And what's going on there spiritually is confusion and mayhem and a mess. But as there is a new, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, I believe there's also going to be another awakening. And that's the term that the New Agers often use, a new, an awakening. It's a resurrection. That's what they're planning. That's what they're plotting. Go to Revelation chapter 17 and in verse 8. It says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not. Okay? So he was, he is not. That's another term for dead. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wander whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And they, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Okay? He was present here. And he is not. Oh, and yet he is. So what's happening here? It's It's like, I believe, a resurrection, a false resurrection, which I believe will lead them to believe a lie. Revelation chapter 13 and in verse 14. Revelation 13 and in verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And there it is, a wound by the sword and did live. They were deceived by the miracles that they had and by that beast that had this wound and did live. Verse 15, and he had power to give life 
unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And so these take a mark in their right hand or forehead to be a part of the economy, to be a part of society because they were deceived by one that had a sword wound and lived and life was given as a result of the false prophet, this other beast here that is mentioned. And so deception happened as a result of this false awakening or false resurrection. And people want to join and be a part of this. They will awake, kind of, but first look at the end of these in Revelation 14. Revelation 14 and verse 9. Revelation 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his right hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name these all cast alive and tormented into that fire and brimstone lake in the presence of God they suffer eternally here but they too will receive in Revelation 20 and verse 11 Revelation in 20 in verse 11, a resurrection of sorts. They will awake, kind of. Revelation 20 in verse 11, 20 in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of, of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to this word according to their works sorry so they stand as dead before god to be judged at this time it's kind of like a little bit of an awakening for them a resurrection of sorts but it doesn't last verse 13 it says the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and who is whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire Look, as much as the resurrection is important to our faith, here the resurrection or being written in the book of life is pivotal to you escaping the second death. It's the other side of that same coin. These are deceived, and the world is about to be, by a false, lying, temporary resurrection. It's a life that is no life at all, and yet that will be the substitute as the devil often has for God's truth, and God's truth is outlined here in Revelation chapter 1, you can go to that, and in verse 18, Revelation 1, and in verse 18, <clears throat> the truth is, as Christ said in Revelation 1 and verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. And while that false prophet temporarily got a sword wound and did live, eventually with all the dead he was cast into the lake of fire. The second death throughout all eternity. And yet here Christ as the true resurrection and the life stands before the Apostle John as he's about to pen the resurrection of himself. And he says very clearly, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I am alive forevermore. So be it. Amen. That's the truth. And this same life, which is Christ, he that liveth, not like the world giveth and will destroy you when you take part of their full resurrection. No, the true resurrection gives life, gives life power gives potency in the life of the believer go to romans chapter 4 romans chapter 4 and we'll learn a little bit about this 
resurrected life. Romans chapter 4. And I bookmarked it and then moved my bookmark. Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> Jesus is the true resurrection and the life. He said that in the scriptures. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me shall never die. Believest thou this? And here in Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, it talks about Jesus, our Lord, who was raised up from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So Jesus died for our offenses. He died for our sins, the Bible says in many places. The purpose of his resurrection then here is very clear, for our justification, to make it just as if I have never sinned, is that phrase we start, like to use about being justified. Just as if I had never sinned is what that means when I stand before God. Therefore, verse 1 of the next chapter, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no other peace. In the last days they will cry, peace, peace, but God vehemently and directly affirms. They'll cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Okay, the only peace comes through Jesus Christ and through being justified by faith in him. But so much the more, Romans chapter 5 and in verse 9 says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Not only are we standing before God justified, we're also saved from the wrath that we deserve. That takes away the indication that there might be um, sins that you would have to turn from or pay for in the past. No, because he says we are justified by his blood, which kind of sounds like that's only from this day on. And then I have to turn from all my sins in the past. No, 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 no. We're saved from wrath. And the wrath of God would have fell on me to the uttermost because of my sin's previous salvation. So no, God very clearly says he has given us peace through Christ, justified us by his blood, and saved us from the wrath that we certainly deserve as a result of our sins. That's a two-way salvation. I'm saved in a moment. That wrath ain't going to hurt me, and I'm justified by his blood. Both directions. I'm covered. I'm saved. I have peace with God. Thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am saved. So what now? What now? Romans 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So given that I've just told you that, hey, you're you're, you're cleared. You're justified by his blood. From this day on, no matter what, Christ is justified. That's a great and wonderful expression of the grace and love of God. That's what that is. But that certainly isn't an encouragement to me to just spit all over it and say, you know what, I'm just going to do whatever I want now. No, we shall not continue because that's what he says in the next verse. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? And remember, his death was because of our offenses. And so when Christ died on that cross, when we believe him, we died with him. That's what happens. We died with him. We were baptized into his death. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, like that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, here it is, we also should walk in newness of life. The example is set. Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, but he rose again according to the scriptures. And the scriptures promise that you were justified by his blood. The scriptures promise that even as Christ walked in newness of life, so shall you be. And that's why when we baptize, we often say, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Because symbolically, you are admitting that that is your goal. That is your intent. That's your desire before God. We should walk in newness of life. But that's always going to be a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Look, God is always in the business of giving us choice. Isn't he in the Old Testament? How often do you see, I have set before thee blessing and curse. I have set before thee life and death. And he says, choose life, choose blessing. Choose that, that you have to make that decision. And even when Christ saves us, the same is true. We should walk in newness of life. Walk in newness of life. That's what you should do. I want you to do that. Shall you continue in sin that grace may abound and you'll continue to reap more of God's wonderful grace to you because you're just continuing in sin? God forbid, you're dead to that. Don't walk in the old man. 
Walk in the new man. That's what you ought to do. Walk in Christ. And that's what I said. When you're in Christ, you're bearing the image of Christ, and you are showing the example that Christ gave on this world in your everyday life. But it takes yielding. It takes, it takes you deciding to put his desires before your own. Verse 5, For as we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Don't serve sin, but serve Christ. Yield unto him. Look at verse 11. Likewise reckon, like set it so, and say stamp it. This is it. This is the truth. Reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Remind yourself every morning, I'm dead to sin. But, watch this, alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's just indicating our life is in Christ. It's in nothing that I can do, but simply life is in Christ. And I need to decide to yield to it. Verse 13, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but watch this, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, your body parts, as instruments of righteousness unto God. In other words, give yourself unto God. Yield yourself unto God. When you hear his command, enter in. Just say, yes, Lord, I will do it. And set yourself to do those things. Walk in Christ and thus show forth that everlasting life by faith. Show forth that you have died and rose from the dead. You are a new creature in Christ and walk in Christ. The Bible says that faith without works is dead, right? And we're to be resurrected. We are resurrected. The, the promise is there. Nevertheless, a lot of us just don't bear that image of Christ. Why? Because we refuse to yield. Faith without works is dead. If you're dead, it's because you're not walking in newness of life. If it's dead, you got no fruit of holiness in your life. If you're dead, there is no change. There is no growth. But God has called us to resurrected living. He has caused us to be, even as Christ rose from the dead, you should walk in newness of life. That's what God wants from us. We're asleep. Proverbs chapter 6. We are asleep. Proverbs chapter 6. This will be the last place I go, I think. <clears throat> we are asleep. We are dead. We need to awake. Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. Christ shall give thee light. Proverbs chapter 6. And in verse 9 it says, How long wilt thou sleep? A sluggard. So we often say to people at the door, it's easy to get saved. It's hard to walk the Christian life. And if we're not walking in the Christian life, quite often it's just because we're lazy. We don't want to read. We don't want to pray. We don't want to seek God. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to, right? Okay? Hey, I'm, I'm with you on this. Don't, don't think I'm picking on anybody. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Have you ever heard that when you rolled over and hit the snooze button? Oh, I hate that. I'm like, I need like, 10 more minutes, and you just, the Holy Spirit's just like, how long wilt thou sleep? And it's like, ah. <laughs> When wilt thou arise out of sleep? And this is kind of the thoughts that cross your mind sometimes when you're feeling a little more carnal, a little more fleshly that day, week, month, however long you've been in that slump, right? You had a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. You know, when you cross your hands across your belly and just lean back in your chair a little bit, stretch out, oh, yeah. Verse 11, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth from thy want as an armed man. That will catch up to you and that armed man will enter in. You will be impoverished. You will be robbed. You will be destroyed as a result. And today is not a good time to be asleep. It's not a good time to be slumbering. Spiritually speaking, we need to awake. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. We need to walk resurrected lives. We need to live resurrected lives. Follow the example of Christ. In John chapter 9 and verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man could work. And Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be held. Oh, wait, no, he didn't say that. He said that to you. 
Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And Christ, while he was here, said, Hey, the night cometh when no man can work. I am here to work the works of him that sent me. He said, As long as, yes, I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But now he says to each one of us, Ye are the light of the world. Ye ought to be alive. Ye ought to be awake. You ought to be in the fight. You ought to be working the works of him that sent you. And Christ sent you. Even as the Father sent Christ, so send I you, he says. He wants us to follow in his footsteps. And Christ died. Yep, you died when you got saved. You were buried. Yep, with him in baptism. You rose from the dead. Even so, you should walk in newness of life. And that is the foundational truth of the Christian life. You need to be alive. You need to be awake. You need to be walking in that same newness as Christ did. You're resurrected today. Yeah, one day you'll be resurrected, given a whole new body. It'll be a lot easier to walk in the Spirit when you don't have this flesh bugging you. But hey, God promises your flesh is dead. Have you reckoned that so? Have you reckoned that your flesh is dead? That old man is dead? Or are you just constantly letting him get up and resurrected and walk around? No, every time he gets up, remind him, hey, you're dead. Put him back down. Walk in Christ. Show his image. That's what the Christians ought to do. That's what believers ought to do. Bear the image of the heavenly. Even a little glimpse of it today. And you can do that. How do you do that? Yield unto his word. Trust him by faith. It's the same formula for everything. Faith. Without faith it is impossible to please him. Believe you're dead and believe you're alive. Believe that the old man has passed away and that you are now in Christ. Free to walk in that newness of life that he promises. And he does promise. And I'm thankful for that. Heavenly Father, 